Då så. Hej alla, god kväll. Good evening på engelska. Eh, ni är jättevälkomna hit. Jag hoppas att ni kommer få en fantastisk kväll. Eh, ni kommer få chansen att lyssna på Peter Kien, dotterson till Gustav Dahlén. Eh, så Peter vill presentera Gustav Dahlén så ni alla känner till vem det är. Och därefter så kommer ni få lyssna på Ivar Jakobsson. Uh, och uh, Ivar har också bjudit in ett nätverk så att han kommer prata på engelska. Uh, and I think Ivar, your presentation will be approximately 6.30. So, so if you have an interest of listening only to, to Ivar in English, uh, you can take a cup of coffee or, or, or you could definitely listen to Peter Keen in Swedish as well when he present uh, his uh, grandpa. Uh, Gustav Dahlin. Uh, for those of you who are here, you are welcome to join uh, to Vikanders later. Det kan jag ta på svenska eftersom er på av er är, är, pratar svenska. Vikanders är ni välkomna till efter. Men där får ni hosta upp lite egna pengar när ni betalar. Uh, vi skyller på inflationen. Ja. Men igen, uh, välkomna alla. Jag säger välkommen till alla hedersmedlemmar som vi har här ikväll. Vi har medlemmar, vi har icke-medlemmar, vi har teknologer, vi har andra också. Alla är jättevälkomna till denna öppna föreläsning. En liten kommentar till er som är medlemmar i Chalmerska ingenjörsförbundet. Ni, ni kan faktiskt nominera någon till ett stipendie från jubileumsfonden. Det är ett stipendie på 10 000 kronor. Den nomineringen behöver komma in till jubileumsfonden senast sista februari. Jag gör en liten reminder på det. Många av er känner till det. Men ni som inte känner till det, ni känner till det nu. Och söker ni efter någon i jubileumsfonden, gå in på hemsidan så hittar ni vem ni kan skicka nomineringen till. Så med det så vill jag be Peter Kien, vars morfar var Gustav Dahlén, komma upp så ska ni få en väldigt intressant föreläsning kring... Vem var Gustav Dahlén? Och vad hittade han på för något spännande? Nej. Peter, jättevälkommen är du. Tack. Ja, det är Gustav Dahlén och en norr som jag kommer tillbaka till och ska förklara lite grann här. Hallå? Hörs det inte? Så. Han påstår att jag inte behövde göra någonting. Är det det som är felet? Ja. Men vi går direkt in på en välkänd bild. Jag tänker inte säga så mycket om det annat att det är en del allvarliga och viktiga gäster hos på Aga. Delvis ifrån Aga USA som har just placerat en jättestor order på fyra och boja. Och så finns det han chefen för Aga i där borta i USA och tillsammans med tekniker och så finns det två, tre Aga folk inklusive Gustav Dahlén. Ja, han står där med käpp, han är enda med käpp. Det kan man direkt tolka med. Han var nog rätt noga med hur han såg ut och jättefina kläder och smärt. Och det är märkligt för bonpojken, han har verkligen vuxit upp. Vad tänkte han med på i huvudet nu när han står där och väntar? Jo, det var den här enorma kanalen, Panama-kanalen, som skulle placera en stor order på Aga och verkligen sätta Aga på, på plats in, på podiet inom eh, stora världen. Ja, jag backar. Varför man byggde med den här kanalen? Ja. Det är naturligtvis handelsförfarten, men ännu viktigare tror jag det var nog att få krigsfartygen att kunna cirkulera mellan Pacific Ocean och Atlantic. Och det gjorde att Agas fina, 
fyrlösningarna som jag kommer tillbaka till. De vann hela slaget av de traditionella stora optiker till eh, optikföretagen som var på med fyrar. Ja, de blev utkonkurrerade med en gång. Så hela industrin, världsindustrin på fyrområdet byttes ut mot Aga. Men innan han kommer vidare så inser han av olika skäl att han måste utbilda sig. Och då valde han som tur är Chalmers. Chalmers byggnaden 1892. Och sen efter, efter Chalmers så fortsatte han med något år till i Schweiz i eh, ETH Syrius högst upp. Inte här nere, det är Syrius dag. Men vilken skillnad från den världen då. Så kom han tillbaka till Sverige och letade jobb vad han ska göra. Så träffade han på då eh, AB gasakkumulator. Vars Fyllning av, av gastuber skedde här. Men han hade en världens tur för det kom en man från Lutsverket, Jan Höjer. Och han förklarade då för akkumulatorbolaget vilka problem de har med acetylen som var jättebra bränsle för, för att fyra det för sig. Men alldeles på tok för dit och osäkert överhuvudtaget. Och det bad han att gasakkumulator skulle fundera på. De hade Dalen då som uh, ja, uh, konsulterande ingenjör hette det just. Och Dalen funderade på det här och han jobbade med det i sitt kök för att det var för fint och för bra att släppa ut på marknaden eller till någon annan. Så han jobbade hemma. Det var höjer jag i yngre dagar. Men det var en mycket kompetent och väldigt bra beställare. Han visste vad han ville ha. Och han kunde definiera precis. Så där Lin nappade med en enda gång. Och det, ja, det tog ett halvår någonting. Hej! Ja, jäklar. Varje ljusblick sträcker 3 tiondel sekund. Den tänds var tredje sekund. Det betyder en gasbesparing på 89 procent. 89? En liter räcker till 10 000 ljusblickstar. Istället för att ladda om fyran en gång i månaden kan du göra det en gång om året. Du sparar folk och arbete. Och pengar. Ska vi... Ja, Dalen nöjde sig inte med beställningen på en klippapparat. Utan han insåg vad potentialen i det här och han fortsatte. Först klippen och sen gasen var högexplosiv och massan som fanns i franska gastuber den packades ihop och så exploderade den. Så det löste de var på Aga. Han insåg att blinket ska inte finnas på natten. Det är väldigt dyrt gas, vi kan inte ha det. Vi måste ha en, någonting som stänger av och sätter på utan något behov av ström eller någonting sådant, utan det är helt mekaniskt och naturlagar som skötte detta. Och det svepade igenom hela fyrvärlden, det här systemet. Det är också så att alenblandaren, det blandar luft och, och acetylen. I England var det enligt lag förbjuden att ha blandat undertryck överhuvudtaget. Dalen insåg att det där är mycket bättre gas med 10 procent acetylen och 90 luft. Så han konstruerade en apparat som gjorde precis det man inte skulle göra och fungerar alldeles utmärkt. Verksamheten växte, man började bygga bojar. Södermalm i Stockholm. Och så småningom så gick affären bra och Aga började bygga en ny, ett nytt kontor, huvudkontor ute på Skärsätra i Lidingen. Och man började bygga fabrik och de, de här fabrikerna de behöver maskingolv, alltså först äh, armerad betong. Och vem var bättre på armerad betong än Kryger och Tolls byggnadsaktiebolag? Det har sina konsekvenser. 
den nya fina Aga-fabriken byggs upp. Man tillverkar små bojar, bojar med gastuben i botten. Och den nya fabriken så tillverkar man stora bojar. Och det fina med det här var att Dalen hade, in, hade infört gassvets i Sverige. Så att alla bojar på det här området kunde svetsas istället för nita som alla andra höll på med. Både lättare, enklare och billigare. Nu kommer vi tillbaka här där Lena fortfarande man funderar på allt det här och undrar hur det här ska gå. Fyra flaskor hade de provat, eldat under och de hade pyst precis som de skulle. Men den femtende krånglade och han gick fram och var nyfiken. Vi väntade länge i för sig, över en halvtimme tydligen. Men han var väldigt nyfiken på vad, vad som har hänt med det här. Men trycket var ju lågt ner. Tyvärr var det fel på tryckmätaren. Hemsk explosionsolycka. Gas och mekulators chef livsfarligt skadad. Verkställande diktör i gas och kumulator, ingenjör Gustav Dahlén erhöll vid explosion så svåra skador att det har att värt att han inte kan räddas. Livet inte kan räddas. Men den syn som mötte den närvarande efter explosionen var fruktansvärd. Direktör Dahléns kropp var till ogenkännlighet tillbyggad och fullt av rop. för att man får en uppfattning om, om vad det här innebär. Så hittar vi en acetylenexplosion. Ja, det ska man undvika. Ur ett brev daterat 1 november 2012. Det är fruktansvärt tungt och dystert att helt plötsligt halva halva hava blivit blind. Trots detta svåra slag börjar jag i mellertid tid resignera och få lite till slut lite löft åter och få jag väl försöka göra det bästa jag kan under dessa förhållanden. Han börjar sin återtåg till normala livet. Då två dagar efter han kom hem ifrån sjukhuset så fick han besked att han hade vunnit tilldelats Nobelpriset i fysik. Han kunde därefter, efter lite tid till konvalescens, träffa sina fyra barn. Och här är min anknytning då till Gustav Dahlén. Det är den här lilla flickan i läxt. Det är min mamma det. Eller var min mamma. Men Dalen var blind totalt. Han kunde inte se någonting. Han behövde hjälp på allt. Och som tur är hans hustru, Elma Dalen, var helt perfekt. Hon ändrade sitt helt livsförande och tog hand om sin man på alla sätt och vis. Ett sätt var som min mor har berättat många gånger att de satt gemensamt, familjen samlad och mormor läste alla detaljer i tidningarna, alla aktier brev som brunt men väldigt fart så att och min mamma lyssnade också noga på vad mormor läste för farfar. Ja, en lycka kommer sällan ensam. Den här fina nya fabriken så visade den där brann upp. Men Dalén han såg inte detta. Så det, det var ju en fördel att vara blind. Då. Han hade ingen aning om vad som hade hänt. 
Men han fick utveckla nytt sätt att arbeta. Telefonen var en räddning. Han sparade talar väldigt mycket i telefon tydligen. Han var god vän med Ellen Eriksson. Och då. Vi ska se vad är det här nu då. Men han var inte helt färdig med fyrarna. Det var ett problem kvar, eller två problem kvar. Det ena var att för stora fyrar måste man ha en, en bälg. Så, eller, ja, jag vet inte, mantel heter det. Ja. Men mantlarna är ju ömtåliga, de går sönder. Det går ju inte att ha i en fyr. Och dessutom har man ingen ström eller något sånt, utan det är helt baserat på, på gastrycket i cylindern. Och det fortsatte han med. Han måste ha haft en uppfattning om hur det skulle se ut. Jag är övertygad om att han hade redan gjort de här planerna när han blev blind. Fyrskeppen var ju väldigt svåra för att blinkarna åkte upp och ner i vågorna. Så han utvecklade ett system med linspendel som gjorde att linsen är alltid i samma läge. Och i och med det så kunde man läsa av fyrens karaktär. Förut så var det bara en vit lampa. Han fortsatte sedan med stora fyrar. Och det, är det som återstod här nu det var att linsen måste rotera. För att rotera den inte på sol, när solen skyndar på så kan det bli eldsvårda. Så att fyren måste cirkulera i den sidan. Och det gjorde han också med en massa hävarmar från trycket på bäljarna i gassystemet i övrigt. I och med det så var fyruppsättningen klart när man kunde överta hela världen i princip. Och det gick jättebra för dem. Men Dalén, han tyckte inte att det här var något vidare för att nu fick andra människor jobba med alla hans projekt. Han var utanför, han kunde inte se så han fick alltid ha någon som förklarar någonting. Men han kände sig ute. Och då funderar jag på nära hemmet, vad, vad, är, vad, vad kan jag göra? Och så på den tiden så hade man ved till vedspis överallt i Stockholm. Och då funderar han på det här, jag ska inte gå in på detalj. Men det är en enda sak, att det var att för att inte brinna alldeles för fort så måste man reglera lufttillförsel. Så han utvecklade ett system för att till, tillföra luft med temperaturgivaren högst upp. Ja, nu fortsätter vardagen. Den här gruppen och Agas direktion 1918 framåt bestod av Rolf von Heidenstam, Sedemera vd och Nils Westberg, en kamrat från Zurich-tiden. Och inte minst ordföranden Arvid Lindman, Agas styrelseordförande. Men viktigaste var att han var styrelsen i Handelsbanken. Det var ju inte dåligt. Det här gänget, fyra, de fortsatte snabbt och utveckla Aga på Lidingen till en världsindustri. Den här anläggningen hade ungefär 30-talet ungefär en tusen arbetare. Medan Aga-fabriken är genom hela världen i övrigt var 4 000 som han arbetar med detta. Aga blev ett känt namn och väldigt många ville komma och besöka den här fantastiska Dalén då, Aga. Så det blir många sådana här uppsandlingar med viktig folk som vill prata med Dalén. Det gällde även royalty, vad nu heter på svenska. Uh, alltså. Kungligheter, ja, okej. Okay. Men det fina med det, eller märkliga med det här var att engelska prinsarna, de två 
Edward och Bertie. De kom på Sverigebesök och besökte givetvis Aga naturligtvis. Fortfarande väldigt fin beskrivet i pressen. Men det intressanta är samma år så sitter de där två prinserna här på varsin sida av kaptenen där. Tredje mannen på höjden där uppe på vänster. Det var min pappa. Eller blev min pappa. <laughs> det visste inte Dalena när han hade träffat blivande svärsonen. Men livet gick sig vidare. Dalen blev mer och mer frisk och återställd. Och här är han ute med sina två döttrar. Min mamma då på vänster, på höger sida. Ja. Hon, eh, året efter så reste hon till England och det var då hon träffade den här trevliga engelsmannen. Och 34 så gifte de sig och flyttade till Sydafrika, Kapstaden, med en gång. Där nere då, 35, så föddes första pojken jag. Gustav Dahlén död. En av vår tids största uppfinnare. Man kan ju stanna lite grann och tänka på morfars egenskaper. Jag, ja, jag var två år när han dog så att, det har ingen mycket kontakt. Däremot så har jag träffat hans eh, barn mycket. Och det kan jag konstatera då att eh, vissa egenskaper i alla fall. Praktiker han var väldigt praktiskt orienterad direkt. What's the problem? Det är standard fråga. Vad är problemet egentligen? Vad håller ni på med? Tekniskt snille, han kunde lösa tekniska problem på ett bra sätt. Tänkte utanför ramarna, han följde inte ramar överhuvudtaget. Utan han har ifrågasett alla ramar. Det spelar ingen roll vem det var. Han var fokuserad, han, han koncentrerade sig på ett problem. Och jag har en bror, Kapstaden. Det är precis det han gör. Och det är rätta fibern på mig för att man hänger inte med. Men han är väldigt duktig på att fokusera på ett problem och skaffa information om det. Ja, det här. Så. Han var framförallt snabb. Han var snabb i att tala fort. Han gick fort. Han bestämde sig fort för. Och sen kombinera det med att vara optimist, en snabb optimist. Det är bra det. Och han, som tur är så blev han visionär. Han arbetade på alla möjliga håll. Även efter han har lämnat Aga. Och ett exempel på detta. Det är krigekraschen 32. Så förlorade Dalen i stort sett sin förmögenhet. Och många andra också. Och alla gick om, han mötte många runt omkring och tyckte det var ju bedrövligt. Då, då, det här fungerar ju inte. De företagen som fanns med i... Eh, jag tappar namnet redan. De, de företagen som, var, som hade gått i konkurs här, de var helt okej. Okay. Och Dalena ansåg snabbt att det var inget fel på grundföretagen utan Kryger, tack. Utan <laughs> Kryger klarade inte av styrningen tydligen. Men Dalén han eh, gjorde istället någonting. Han måste fixa till det här. Och vad gjorde han då? Ja, han funderade på att man måste ju vara optimist. Så han gick ut och beställde var optimist nålar och delade ut till alla han ansåg var pessimister. Och det intressanta är att de första Aga-produkterna nu är överspelade. Men den här optimistlånen, nålen, den tycks vara väldigt populär och fortsätter att gå framåt. Jag hoppas påverka folk också. Men Aga då? Vad hände med Aga? 
Jo, den ena hade arbetat upp en aga där det fanns en kreativitet, en nyfikenhet och även blandade in sina anställda med lösa tiglar och de fick arbeta många gånger ganska fritt. Det har sina konsekvenser. Ibland lyckas de, ibland lyckas de inte. Men som ett exempel på detta, 1954 praktiserade jag på Aga och utanför korridoren på verkstaden så stod en konstig apparat. Jag frågade, vad är det för någonting? Hjärtlögnmaskin, sa de då. Jaha, varför var det här? Jo, vi måste hitta en pump som inte förstör blodpropparna, blodplättarna. Och då har vi hittat lite information om den här uppfinningen då. When I 1958 was chief in Uppsala, I could develop together with Aga on leading it my own oxygenator called the Björk Aga. It had a special uh, blood level control. It was a rubber membrane and when the level came down low, the machine stopped automatically. Here you see the three pumps in uh, the, my oxygenator. The first one to the left pumps the blood into the patient. The second pumps the uh, coronary perfusion. And the third pump um, sucks blood back from the heart. And here you see the blood pressure being registered and um, this is the discs rotating with 100 discs 5 liter of blood per minute could be oxygenated I think this was the best uh, uh, practical oxygenator for 15 years used all over the world. Here you see the membrane uh, keeping the blood level at a certain level. And the three pumps. The left one pumps the blood into the patient, the middle one for coronary perfusion and the one to the right is just sucking blood from the heart. There I use a filter to be sure that no bubbles come into the patient. Ja, därmed så är vi tillbaka den eh, första bilden som jag började med en gång i tiden. Förklara lite grann av Dalen och förklara lite grann av den där kvarvarande produkten från Aga. Men sen gäller det då att lämna över till medaljören. Och där upptäckte jag... Det var lite av damage. Det skadar mycket av tries också. Det är det de behöver. En mer än solid Northampton scrum. They're winning five, six, seven. They nearly won 10 meters off that drive. But the only thing that can come out of this is a penalty or, or, or a try. Now they're in that much disarray. They might as well give the penalty away on the halfway line rather than waiting until they get to the 22 before. Ja, det är väl så att när jag läste igenom då förutsättningarna för Gustav Dahlin med Dörren så var jag helt borta och tyckte att så här kan man inte jobba. Det, det är fullständigt omöjligt. Jag, arbetade hela livet i mekanisk motorutveckling på och det här låter väldigt främmande men när jag läste vidare så kom jag till ordet scrum och det är så att jag född och uppväxt i Sydafrika i Kapstaden jag spelar mycket rugby så varje skol då tio år har jag spelat rugby och vilken position jo mitt i scrum den av uppgiften är att när bollen kastas in att man ska 
Hooker helt på plats att han som har sagt att ta av honom. Och det är precis vad de håller på med här. Då tyckte jag att nu förstår jag. Tänk om jag hade gjort så att problemet vi fick på Volvo naturligtvis en massa problem. Att vi hade använt skrammetuden som jag gissar, jag har inte läst färdigt. Och det tyckte jag var ganska förlösande. Vad bra det är med en jämförelse. Då är jag färdig. Peter, jättetack. Vi kommer tillbaka till dig lite senare. Jag hoppas ni alla uppskattar en Gustav Rallén story och lärde er någonting. Och om ni inte tänker på vad ni lärde er så tänk på det sista, var optimist. Då blir livet mycket lättare. Stort tack Peter. Jag kan ingen rugby. Så jag tänkte jag skulle gå tillbaka till ett 20 år gammalt dokument och presentera IVA lite. Och det är ju kopplat till som ni såg på, på Peters presentation. Att IVA är medaljör 2003, det vill säga för 20 år sedan. Så det är en liten sen föreläsning som IVA kommer ge oss idag, men bättre sent än aldrig, det tycker jag är bra. Så I'll turn to English for your network also, uh, IVA. Uh, you took uh, your Master of Science here at Chalmers, at Electro, in 1962. Uh, then you made your service, as some people say. You made your military service at Volvo, Christian. Uh, others did their service at Ericsson. So you went to Ericsson 63 and worked there until 87, 1987. But during that time, uh, you also made your thesis uh, uh, at another, uh, what should we call that? Another school, KTH, Kungliga Tekniska Högskolan. Uh, we understand why you did it, because you lived up in Stockholm, it was closer there, and going down to Gothenburg all the time. Uh, but you also uh, had, say, a couple of, of years where you, where you stopped working and at Ericsson. Instead, you created your own company. Uh, so you, you created the company Functional Systems, that Inator bought, uh, but that was not the only company you started. You also started 87 when you stopped working for Ericsson. Objectory, uh, uh, Objectory AB, uh, that went together with, with Rational uh, and later bought by IBM. 2002 it was bought by I IBM. You received your Gustav Dahlén medal. Uh, very much for, for the development of various programming methods that I think you will talk to us and teach us about today. Uh, but it was very much linked to objective methods or object methods, if that's the right word in English. Uh, and and uh, in the invitation to this speech you could see, say, UML and, and RUP as acronyms for certain things, and UML was then uh, Unified Modeling Language, where Ivar was one of the founding fathers for that, together with some other guys. And that tended out to be the objectory method. Uh, and at Rational, you also led, say, the development of, of another standard, uh, and that was the Rational Unified Process, RUP, then. Uh, and, and I told Mats Lundqvist, who you also will hear later today when he arrived, that to me also, as Peter, have been working in the auto industry. This is Henry Ford level, what Ivar has done. He has completely changed the entire environment uh, for various businesses. So it's, it's high level, like Gustav Dahlén, that's also Henry Ford level uh, in another area. Uh, and I think what you have done, Ivar, uh, that is that you have, you have found ways of develop software with, with very good predict, what do you call that? Förutsäg förutsägbarhet. Pre predictability, yeah, thank you. Uh, when it comes to the results, uh, the delivery time, quality and cost and so forth. And we are all looking forward very much to listen to you now. So welcome here, Ivar. Thank you. <coughs> so
So first, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, he was the greatest, Gustav Dahlén. And to get a medal with his name from Chalmers um, surprised me, made me unbelievably happy. So my talk today is about the uncomfortable truth of software engineering. We'll see what that is and how to cure it. So this is 2003. Chalmers gave it, uh, awarded me with that. Party time. Um, fantastic, Sim simple said. The biggest thing that happened to me in my professional life. Um, I got it for developing software systems, um, better, faster, cheaper. But the most important thing was use cases. It's very, when I look back and think about that use cases, the concept of use cases became revolutionary. It's has been strange for me all these years and still is strange. What we actually do is that we, before we develop anything, we find out how we're going to use it. What a strange invention, huh? <laughs> I mean, isn't that obvious? Well, we did more. Um, we developed it into, so it supported software development. Um, I wrote about uh, a paper about this almost 20 years before I got the medal. Um, I s tried to publish it in 1986, but uh, people, the program committee said, this is not interesting. So I published the same paper one year later, and then there was a better program committee. So I got the paper accepted. And, and um, this has been a paper I have been able to reference for all these years. It's amazing. Use cases was from the beginning a technique, but it turned out to be a normal English word. So now if you go and look for a, a new product, self-driving cars, you will find the use cases of self-driving cars. If you look for big data, you will find use cases of big data. And basically any, any product, you will find the use cases. More than 80 billion hits on Google. And it has probably helped a little. 30, 40 years earlier from I got my medal, I started to work at Ericsson. I left Chalmers. I was very fascinated with research, but I felt uh, I should understand what it means to be an engineer. So that when I went to Ericsson, I didn't look for the most um, modern uh, research-oriented job. I looked for something that was really engineering namely working with what my colleagues felt, old-fashioned relay switches, telecom switches. But it was, um, I learned something I couldn't learn anywhere else. I learned system thinking. I learned project management. Because in the computer department, they came directly from the university, most of them. And very little real practical and quality from the beginning. I remember in particular when I worked with the old-fashioned system and I did a design of a, a circuit, a relay circuit, and I did some mistake. The lab, the boss of a lab, 
came to me and said, Eva, come here. Look here what you have done. We have built five prototypes and you have introduced such a defect. They talk about defects. So when I came to this computer uh, department, they talked about bugs, small innocent things that creep in little here and there. It's just a few bugs we have here. We need to debug it. That was a cultural shock for me. So, but after a couple of years, I felt it's time for me to join this department. And I knew nothing about programming when I moved over. I knew nothing about computing. But for some reason, I became project manager. Uh, it's called system manager or something like that. But it meant I should uh, run the project. And um, I s there was nothing to read. So what I had to do is to look at programs. I started at night, uh, children in bed at uh, 8, 9 o'clock, and then 2 o'clock. I was reading. And after three months, you know, I was 28. So after three months, I felt now I know everything, almost everything. So I went to my boss, um, Lars Ulof Norain, who some of you know, and uh, told him, this will never become a product that we can market and adapt to every country around the world. Uh huh. You have a solution. Okay, if 28, of course, you have a solution. So I suggested instead of doing what we were doing, and the whole world developing software at that time, a system had two parts, a program and data. And they were hierarchically developed in parallel. The problem with that was dramatic. If you made a change anywhere, you didn't know where these changes would happen. So um, instead, I felt with my background from hardware, why don't you use components? Another such a dramatic invention. Think about why not use components instead of doing this kind of stuff. As you understand, I felt it was not so dramatic. I couldn't understand that it it was a big thing. And uh, my boss, he said, uh, it looks interesting. Let me go and talk to my boss. And, and we talked to him and he said, I don't understand anything. You have to talk to our boss. And that was actually Kurt Katzev, uh, that some of us know. And Kurt, he said, um, uh, uh, basically, do whatever you want to do, Lasse. And that was my boss. It took eight months before we had a meeting and decided. Uh, Lars Nguyen, he presented this component-based solution. It looks like this. So basically, a system of interconnected components uh, with interfaces between the components. What an invention, huh? And um, he said, basically, uh, Katzev said, do as you want, Lars. After eight months of discussion, we, Lars Ulf Norain arranged a meeting with 13 managers. And he asked everyone about, what do you think about this solution? Do you know what the most positive guy said? I don't know. There was, that was Ulf Eriksson, by the way. <laughs> Anyway, so you see, I'm not particularly impressed by it, uh, but it components were born. And we, uh, in, in 1967, and it actually was introduced. But um, that was not the whole thing. Because um, what we did, and this is not my uh, I was not involved in that. 
I is involved in identifying the component idea. But uh, Jöran Hemdahl, who is quite known in the telecom world, he came up with something that is that's really was dramatic. Components all the way down. Not only in the design, but also in the computer architecture and in the firmware. And he also developed a language, Plex. And these two things together made a huge difference. Uh, also components sideways, as I call it. For instance, at that time we had something very similar to what we call DevOps today. Everybody, uh, I mean, DevOps is uh, how many years? 50 years later? But that really made a dramatic difference to Ericsson. Uh, I remember when Bill Gates presented 1991 components to the world, then Microsoft had invented it. And today it's standard. So that resulted in the greatest commercial success story in the history of Sweden. Uh, that is what I've been told, the AXE system. I don't know if uh, Spotify has beaten it, but uh, it was at that time anyway a good thing. And while we were still on the swing, we came up with, uh, as you heard Paul talk about, UML, which is uh, modeling language, a blueprint language we made draw, and that became a standard. And it was at that time used every company, Ericsson, Volvo, just to mention a few. And um, <coughs> then we designed uh, um, a way of working that was actually designed in Sweden. And um, by the way, my company, Objectory, um, the chairman of Objectory was my friend Boo Hedfors. So you, you understand why it went quite well. Um, and we also did artifi artificial intelligence, something we talked about many years. And uh, we set up a c I set up a company with my daughter, Agneta Jacobson, who is uh, now working very much with artificial intelligence. We uh, set up a company to develop uh, support for rational unified process using AI technique, intelligent agents. So now we are get uh, your RAP. It was um, RAP was actually by OVUM, an organization like Gartner, classified as the only process really worth the name. So it went and so intelligent. Okay. All that went viral uh, at that time, but now we are back to 2003 and we saw clouds, lots of clouds on the sky. So you see here this curve, RAP and UML went up and was incredibly popular. People call me a guru. Um, something I felt very uncomfortable with me because uh, gurus is salespeople. They are not necessarily experts. And <coughs> they sell method or sell something like that. Uh, and then instead, a new trend came, agile. Agile development, which became incredibly popular and still is. Uh, there is no down yet. And uh, I don't think it will ever, I mean, agile, we should always be agile, but uh, there will be other techniques. And what happened is that everything that was with RAP was just thrown out. We have all the people here. I know you invested a lot in RAP. So out with that, in come the new thing. Ericsson invested a lot in RAP and UML, and today they, they still have it. They, okay. Um, so anyway, that is one of the things, and it's crazy that we throw out something. There is always something good. Is there no way we can just incrementally improve? 
we could have done it, but we, the people who were promoting Agile uh, were so successful in telling the world what rubbish RAP was and UML. But it will be, it, it's coming back, ideas are coming back. So this was 2003. It's a good time to retire. I was not a young boy, but I felt that I was a young boy. But it was never in my mind. I just loved what I was doing. Now, what should you do as a retired a retiree? Well, I looked at the problem. And we looked like a fashion industry. Every 10 years, we threw out what we had and in with some new idea. I, I personally threw out, uh, not only me, but I was on a trend that threw out the old-fashioned way of working with uh, program and data separate and introduce object orientation and components. That was around 1990. So, I'm not going to go through all this, but you can see here is different, different philosophies that came and replaced one another. And the old stuff was just bad. Now, in, in 2000, we got Agile. I've sort of said that before. Now it's about scaling Agile. And what's happened next? Of course, will that be compatible? So we have the risk of an ending up in the same, same way. We looked at the fashion industry. We had methods war. This is something we have had all the way since 1960s. So around every method, there is a group of people who loves it. And they use all kinds of uh, arguments to sell it and to kill the other methods. Uh, I have lived it. So everyone talks about this methods war. It's been there now for so long. And not only that, we are relying on gurus. So we have, I can list a number of people who are really guru status. I'm not that. And I'm happy because I don't think it's uh, uh, professional. So not just experts. Uh, instead, of methodolo gurus are methodology salespeople. And industry like ours, with 27 million programmers around the world, big companies in Sweden have 10, 20,000 employees that work with programming. And the most terrifying is that they still work as if software development is more of a craft than an engineering discipline. Can you imagine a company that 10,000 programmers are working as a craft? Of course, we always need craftsmen, but we should work on a higher level, not as a craft. It's very expensive, bad quality, and so on. So here is, a, a, this is an article a couple of years ago, showing the different camps, the different methodology, how they fight one another, and so on. So it's, it's not something I invent, it's uh, well known. We had no common ground between methods. So if you look at, here's a whole bunch of methods. They don't share anything. They are everyone, if you learn one and want to learn something else, you have to start over again and sit in the benches and learn. Even if you have worked 20 years with software engineering, you have to be a student again. That is horrible. The only thing we basically share between them is the alphabet. Alphabet. English alphabet. We lacked credible experimental evaluation and validation. So we throw out our old method and replace it with a new popular one without fully understanding the consequences. I mean, when people threw out 
rub and took in agile. They didn't know they missed architecture. So software was developed without having an architecture. What happens with that? You have enormous maintenance costs in the future. So, um, okay, that was a very nice slide, but it disappeared now when I moved it to, to this machine. The only slide that had a video. <laughs> and then we have a split and had a split between industry practice and academic research. The split between industry, I want to say a few words about that. In 1970, when we had invented components, a professor at KTH said, this is a dead end. In 19 81, a professor at Linköping Technical High School said, what you do with hundreds of people, we can do with 12 people. I can go on here. Erlang was developed at Ericsson. And it was considered a hybrid, a bastard. It's one of the most popular languages today. But it had to leave Ericsson. And it's now an open source. We have aspect on that, and, and, and so on. It goes on this. So, um, w in some of these things I talk about now, have existed the whole time, since the 60s, but we didn't express it. We didn't identify that as a problem, and that is one of the most important patterns: identify the problem, and then have a solution. So uh, <coughs> I think uh, this is not controversial. Everyone agrees that these are horrible things that we are suffering. Um, so basically, we need to increase what we share between. At that time, in 2009 was the first time I, we wrote about this split between academic research and so on. At least I was part of it. And at that time, um, I had, uh, as a colleague, uh, Professor Bertrand Meyer from ETH, as you mentioned, ETH uh, in, in Zurich. And um, we agreed that uh, the value you got at that time from the academic research was less than 1% of the research. We cannot be happy with that. Or can we? I don't know what it is today, but I think um, uh, it's not easy. I cannot, myself, I, I follow development very well, but I cannot point at many things that we, anything uh, particularly, not, nothing big, I, a few things that uh, we have learned from research. So these are the uncomf uncomfortable truth of software engineering. We look like a fashion industry, we had methods wars, and we are relying on goods, we had no common ground, we lacked credible experimental evaluation and validation. We had a split between industry practice and academic research. I call this um, some of the craziest thing with methods and war frameworks. Use the word craziest thing in an academic engineering context. Then you have to really think it's horrible as it is. So now we are addressing these crazy things. In, um, in my team, in my company, we Instead of inventing yet another uh, method competing with uh, all these that are now popular, we said we need to find out what is it that is common for all methods. And identify that in such a way, it's, it sounds quite simple, but it was, um, it's not enough with just what is common. You need to get value. So uh, we identified what we called at that time, the essentials of software engineering. Uh, and it, 
we did it in three different steps. In, in, uh, in my small company, we had about six people working full time and there's no money in it at all. You have to really believe in it. And uh, I didn't expect it would take 20 years, but um, it did. Uh, and then in 2009, I understood we need to broaden. We need to create a community. And we call that community CMAT. And that stands for Software Engineering Method and Theory. We got, uh, we started that um, to create a widely agreed, accepted common ground. Widely accepted was key for us. We started by writing a call for action. And uh, the key points here was first, software engineering is gravely hampered today by immature practices and specific problems included. And they are the things I talked about earlier. We support the process to refound software engineering based on a solid theory, proven principles, and best practices that include a kernel of widely agreed elements. So we first we asked uh, thought leaders. We went out to all famous people, not all, but many famous people, uh, in academia, in industry, methodologists, computer scientists, all. It was um, me, I, I triggered it, and then I got um, uh, Burton Meyer, uh, one of the most uh, prestigious computer scientists from ETH, and Richard Soli, who was chairman of the Standardization Forum. And then there are many names. If you are in this space, you would recognize basically most of them. And the grand vision was to support the process and to include a kernel. We also wanted to have corporate signatories. We got Ericsson as one of the corporate signatories. We got Saab as one of the... So that went up in the organization. Can we support this? We got Huawei. You know what Huawei is. Not very popular. IBM, Microsoft, to sign this, um, signa, uh, this call for action. In the academic world, we got Chalmers, uh, Jürgen Hansson. He was a professor here. He was personally very interested in this. And at KTH, uh, we got um, uh, a signature too. And many universities around. We stopped asking many more because we felt we had enough support after two years. So now, in 2014, we worked. We got a common ground as an international standard. Uh, I don't know if you have worked with international standards, but it's not a trivial thing to get it through. We had opposition. Uh, the, most, the worst um, opposer was actually IBM because they had something that would be kicked out if Essence became a standard. But they lost the voting, so it became that was a long process to get this through. And <coughs> lots of work. So what is essence? It doesn't co attempt to be an alternative to any existing method. It's designed to just make them better. Existing methods, all methods are passive. You can read about them, you can watch videos, you can uh, do all kinds of stuff, but you don't get a response. One of the things you can do with Essence, it's only one of the things, there are many others, is that you can make any method active. So you actually play games and get people motivated and learn. So it's a fundamentally different way of thinking when it comes to developing software. In fact, not just software, but systems, business, anything related to engineering. So um, um, it's very wide. 
It has been used in Sweden, for instance, for innovation, create an innovation framework. You have heard the story about the elephant and the nine blind men that touched a pot of the elephant. And they all had different opinions about what it was. It's a kernel, it's a learning aid, it's a thinking framework, it's a language, it's lots of practices, it's some cards and card games. But it's many, many other things. In a nutshell, we got, um, for the first time, a common ground. We have never had any objection to the result. No one has said this is bad or we don't believe in it. We had objection when we started CMAT because some people didn't want it to happen, but not when we have seen the result. It's just this, it takes a little too long time to get your head around it. You have to spend two days. But today, two days is far too much. So it takes longer time. But we have to, we have, um, uh, now the last year it has uh, dramatically changed. So it is uh, common ground. Um, it um, has a language. It's very vis vis simple. It contains five uh, different icons or something. And, um, but the most important is that this language has a deep semantics. So you can, you can develop so much more than most other, as of using cards or games is an old story. We have done that for a long time. But the games, the, the, the cards used the language where you had to rely on your intuition. And intuition can take you a little piece. But if you really want to be able to play hundreds of games, serious games, which is so powerful. There needs to be semantics. And then the kernel is, you can think about essence as a domain model, a model of uh, important elements. And um, uh, so there are essential things to work with, essential things to do, and essential uh, competence that you need to have. It's not a big. As I said, you can, we can teach it in, in two days and then people get the whole idea. We teach it, of course, in one hour too. We have a forum, Essence for Agility, with 4,000 members. Where we present how Essence is used in different contexts. So Essence can help any method to become active. It uses card. Card are very powerful because you can talk, you have a card, you can talk about it, discuss it, and it's very, a very easy user experience. The old fashioned user experience with books and so on is just people don't read books in general, only at university, if they are forced to do it. Here I was talking in, in uh, China and um, had 30 scum masters. They just loved playing. And every, every practice is a deck of cards. For instance, Scrum is at 21 cards, small poker size cards, and you can play and discuss things. It's all about user experience. We are not, in general, engineers, doesn't like to sit and read for hours and hours. They want to be effective quickly, and that's what happens. In Academ academia, um, we wrote a book in 2019. This book, uh, The Essence of Software Engineering, um, was designed to be used by people first coming directly from high school. That cannot be done. Uh, software engineering is usually taught a little later uh, at the school when you have a lot of experience. But this is so systematic, so even um, newcomers can learn it. It's adopted, if you talk about academia, um, 
There are many universities around the world using it. We had one professor uh, here at Chalmers, but he left and there is no replacement. He was very, very excited about it. But I understand, people have their own agenda and you have to break through. I think uh, industry adoption will, will help us. Uh, we have created a forum, Essence Education Forum, with more than 60 university professors to promote Essence. The book is translated to Japanese. Um, the killer use cases for uh, uh, academia, there is some, some really important thing that you get thanks to, uh, thanks to uh, how it's designed. Um, you don't only teach essence. With teaching essence, you basically teach every part of every method. Past and future. You have a common understanding of the essential element of software engineering. And that's not trivial. It's quite a lot. You equip, equip students with a language that can describe any development method. And your students are on a path to systematically learn practices updated as well as new forever. We have never been able to do that in the history. Um, in research, we are towards a core theory in software engineering. This is something that people have been talking about. Can we find a core fear in software engineering? And there are, have been discussions, no, yes. There are lots of small theories, many theories, but they are not kept together under an umbrella. Pontus Jonsson at KTH says, Essence takes the first step by proposing a coherent, general, descriptive theory of software engineering. That's the language of software engineering. As a descriptive theory, the essence can be used to describe and facilitate discussion of future predictive theories. So a theory needs to have both the descriptive part, but also a, a prescriptive. And he thinks we are on a very good way. This area of research is rich and untapped. So now, it took a few more years before we got ad adoption in the industry. We have um, now, one year ago, in 2021, we had one client that bought into this whole thing. Today we have three big companies putting in millions in adopting Essence. And we have a pipeline of many companies that want to adopt it. Big companies around, even in the car industry, but not the car in the company I would like to have, but in the car industry, actually. I can reveal it's in Germany. So we are very optimistic this will take on. We are now also working, we have tools to help uh, people. Without tools, you cannot, uh, you can actually not do all the things. So um, we have tools and we are right now working to make it very generally adoptable. So uh, we make it soft as a service. So we don't need consulting to take it. That is the killer use cases in the industry. I like this expression f of Winston Churchill. This is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. It may be the end of the beginning. And that's how I feel. There is so much more to come. And still where we are today gives a lot of value to companies. So uh, the killer use case here, or I, I think I have to, I, is it okay? It's okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I don't think I have so much to more. So um, if we look at the teams, what the killer use case of the teams are, they can select their own method. Today, 
every big company, almost, you have to use this method. And that is designed by one guru and his team. And it's impossible that they can have a complete view of everything that happens in the whole industry. With, you can build an ecosystem where all the knowledge, we are on a good path to that. We have an ecosystem with 100 practices, uh, 30 are public. So uh, we don't, when we create this ecosystem, we always work with the founder of the idea. We don't try to interpret what they are doing. That only would make them my enemy and I want to have friends. So that's one, select your own method. And another thing that these problems, that it took a long time before I could formulate them. Many people don't react to it, they don't understand. But if you, one of us bridging the gap between learning and delivery, we spend a lot of time on learning. We have certification, uh, if you take Scaled Agile, which is one of the most popular methods today, they have a certification program that is enormous. But they're only learning. When you then have to do the job, you don't recognize your situation. With essence, you solve it. I call this the Achilles heel of method adoption. With essence, it's possible to bridge this. And we are doing it. And then user experience that is active, I mentioned that earlier. So it helps team to get quicker. Instead of passive, uh, you sit there and, and watch a presentation or something. Instead, you learn while you work. And gamifying software engineering. If you take organizations as other killer use cases, you get a common ground, ground and an ecosystem of practices. So you can imagine. Volvo. I'm sure there are many ideas outside any big company, even a small company. There are many ideas, but they are floating around and they are not integrated in an ecosystem. Here you have all the practices in the ecosystem and can, and what does that mean? And it's not a local, it can be a global all the world. It means that if there is changes to a practice, it will appear in this ecosystem. So if Jeff Sutherland wants to change, it will be available. When I came up with these use cases, uh, 1992 was it published and then it became viral. Um, people are still using what I did in 1992. They don't know that we have done a lot of development since 1992. That's not available for anyone. This is what we get from that. And we create a systematic learning organization because they have a s one language, they learn everything with one language and one ecosystem. And um, that can go on forever, at least till something totally breaks it. And we are not there yet. And the most important is that we move from software development primarily being a craft to primarily being an engineering discipline. That will make huge impact on quality, costs, anything. Okay. So this is just saying the same thing. And um, we are talking about third group, the fourth leaders. Earlier I said academia, uh, industry, but the fourth leaders are super critical to get them to accept, adopt essence. And we have been, and Jeff Sutherland, who is the founder of SCAM, he said, essence is the key to driving success. So he has been very helpful in, in it. So <coughs> what do we have now? that we've worked with, and this is uh, out. Well, we have a SCAM, SCAM at scale. The Spotify model is very popular in banking and insurers. It's essentialized together with Spotify people. 
Use of stories is essentialized with Mike Cohn, who is uh, under the four of us. Use cases we've used of stories is ours. The Kanban method is one of the most important. It's an alternative to Scrum, and you can actually combine them. It's an incredibly popular way of uh, organizing work and uh, explore more and more as you go. We have in the pipeline working with nine different uh, methods and practices, and it's growing. We didn't have this 2021. So this happened uh, after summer 2020. We also have a partnership with um, a superstar, Dave Snowden, who has developed something that is very complementary. So it's not in any way uh, overlapping. It's just there is a beautiful complement. So what, where are we in the future? Uh, we are harvesting. We know the harvest. And I'm sure you will you know what I'm going to talk about when it comes to the future, to some extent. There is much more to essence. As I said before, it's just uh, the beginning that we have been able to develop. And still, we get a lot of value. What I hope to address is the split between industry practice and academic research. It would be wonderful if we could work with Chalmers and software engineering department here. I gave a talk here uh, two months ago, or three months ago to them. Uh, the problem is that they are so busy doing what they plan to do. But they said uh, it can be in our pipeline. Let's see. Um, what we need to really make a dramatic change in this split is to have some crown jewels which we can all polish. The problem is to find these crown jewels. But it could be essence if, if we succeed to convince. We are doing, uh, we have much more interaction with universities outside Sweden. Uh, I was at an investment party in last set Sunday. And um, there was a Swedish guy who presented a huge investment project. They were looking for 750 million uh, euro. Um, and he, so we, he was asked the question, how is the Swedish audience reacting to this proposal? <laughs> You're not a prophet in your own country. That is his answer. Uh, I think we are more successful uh, outside Sweden. That is, uh, and, and when use cases became popular, where did it become popular? I presented it uh, a lot in Sweden, but no, nothing special, nothing new. It became popular in the United States, but then it came back to Sweden. So I am not surprised, I'm not, uh, I don't, I'm not disappointed, I just wish it would be different. Of course, this is, AI. We have heard about ChatGPT and all the things we are doing. We have worked with AI to support in software engineering since 1981. LMTEL uh, worked with that. I participated in the project. Um, it was very expensive to get a computer that could help with AI. It cost over $100,000 at that time. In 2001, I uh, founded a company with my daughter, Agneta, and we used AI, we used intelligent agents to support RAP. And it was very successful with the clients that used it. Um, uh, Swedbank used it, Aetna used it, we had a very good, but it was the wrong time. Agile went up and RAP went down, so timing was wrong. But, of course, I knew this will come back. So we see, of course, a huge um, potential for AI enabled practices. Uh, not to replace software engineering. So it's not that AI takes over and fix software engineering. Software engineering will use and apply a AI techniques to, um, to uh, make 
the process better. So it's, it's the same as the president of Microsoft, uh, what's his name? Indian guy, sorry. He said, we are going to use ChatGPT and similar techniques for all products. The product doesn't dis don't disappear, but they will be uh, more powerful. So uh, we see it as a two-stage process. We create an ecosystem of practices, and then we apply AI to make it more effective. And this is not far away. This is uh, quite close. So, thank you, Shalmos. Um, I cannot express in simple words how much it meant for me personally, not only as a gratitude, but in my professional life, to be awarded the Gustav Delaine Medal. I'll finish with this. Joseph Pellerin was C CTO of eBay. He says, I now consider Essence to potentially be the biggest step forward in the method space since the Agile Manifesto. So welcome to the future. It will be fun. Fantastic, Eva. Thank you so much. Now you who are here tonight physically now you will have an opportunity and that is to ask some questions to Eva. unfortunately those of you who are watching this on 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 youtube you cannot ask any questions but you can learn and maybe come to the next presentation which is march 9. but anyone that has a question to Eva? i think uh, we need a microphone for yeah we will hand out microphones we have two Maybe I should force someone to ask a question. Bosse, can't you fool them? Was it overwhelming? <laughs> <laughs> Who is speaking? Vent a little, Björn. My name is Gunnar Karlstedt, and uh, my question to you is about religion. And uh, we have said religion in all these aspects. Uh, the program has been closer. a sort of religion. Yeah. And the question is if that religion will develop in future to other directions. I mean, if you go back and see what's happened, you talked about the di different methods. And you have one here, and the question is if that is one part of a religion, and there will be another religion in the future. Yeah. I mean, um, I would be very worried if I um, was responsible for... Uh, a huge software development uh, organization and um, had to live with an organization that uh, were pr primarily uh, working as a craft. And uh, uh, I think uh, this, this is uh, much more fundamental. It's starting basically to find the, the uh, DNA of software engineering. And that is not changing as much as how um, how it's applied. But the, views, the beauty is that it's applicable today to uh, companies, um, even very big companies. Okay, we have another question up here. Yeah, Ivar. Um, my name is Bjorn Albrechtsson. I'm an old uh, chairman of the association. And um, congratulations to your very fine prize medal. When we now have listened to Peter Keane and the outstanding Gustav Dahlén, and now to you as you are plowing away for a new approach to the future, what can we, Chalmerists, and what can Chalmers as a university do to facilitate that your dreams will come true and that we can sort of fly on the, those wings also? <sighs> uh, 
Uh, it's um, the million dollar question. <laughs> I, I don't know what Chalmers can do. What uh, I have to do is to continue um, expressing these ideas and uh, I think the most important is that we get uh, uh, industry adoption. Then uh, Chalmers will, uh, will probably have to stop from, I mean, they, everyone has so, are so busy. They have our plans. And here, Eva come and tell them they should look at this. There's no room for it. There's no room. They, they, uh, the, the feedback I got in November when I spoke to the software engineering people here was they, they like it. I got positive feedback. But uh, <laughs> uh, we, d we cannot do much now. All people who are working on masterpieces has already got what they are supposed to do. So it's not easy. No, I think uh, I just have to work harder. And, and uh, make sure we get the companies that tell about this. And we have case studies in the pipeline that are just fabulous. It just takes a long time. And companies don't want to really uh, talk too much about uh, case studies. But we have. My name is Gunilla Karlsson, and uh, I, my name is Gunilla Karlsson, and uh, I work at a family company, Lidol. I'm from, I, <laughs> I went to electrical engineering it at Chalmers once time ago. And um, we work with AI and hear, uh, to help hearing impaired and deaf people and with communication. But my question or my think is more related to impressions that I got from my son who is at Chalmers today and also from meeting other students. I've got the impression that how we work together as a team and how to use methods is something that we learn later. First, we learn the hard stuff about computing, and then later we do the other things, if we choose to do that. But from what I see, it might be important that they use it from the beginning. So I was very happy to see that your, the book you showed was actually for <laughs> new First students. New students, yes. Yes, that's brilliant. So maybe one way is to start like Forening um, uh, <laughs> Association, yes, student association, just to or to use those student associations that are already available to to work from bottom on up, bottom up, and from the young. Yeah, coming and asking for it. Yes. Yes. Um, I can say that um, Pekka Abrahamson. Uh, he is now uh, uh, at Uveskala University. He was earlier in Trondheim University, and he had 600 students that he taught um, essence. Uh, and w what they got, they got the task, uh, building robotics, um, but they had to describe how they worked using essence. So everyone had to describe what method they used. And uh, that was, uh, according to Becca, incredibly successful. He is continually saying that, um, for me, uh, software engineering will be driven by essence. So, uh, and that is for young students. Yes, um, thank you so much for a very nice presentation. Um, I have a little clarification question. You got the medal for your work on components. Is that, that that's correct, right? It, it was software engineering in more general, but probably it was. <laughs> right, and that's, um, that it's from there the idea of Essence was born? Sorry? W is it from there that the idea of Essence was born? Um, or was it later? Mm, 
really, mm. it was not. Uh, really, I, it was when I looked at having been uh, a guru and uh, traveling around the world uh, selling uh, method. <laughs> And then I felt this is ridiculous. This is not what an industry uh, so huge like the software industry, where we spend uh, maybe trillion dollar per year on developing products, should be more scientific. And um, so then I we started uh, um, in my company. Uh, I have brilliant people in my company, and we came up with we need to find. Uh, uh, the common ground. We need to see what is common. And from the beginning, we didn't see that we could get so much. From the beginning, we just wanted to build an ecosystem of practices. This thing about activation came much later. So, and, and the interesting thing, if, if I look back at what I've done, I have basically everything I had there. I have um, followed a pattern. Um, I have identified a problem that basically no one had talked about. And then I solved that problem. So other people said, this makes sense, this is a problem. Do you have a solution? Of course. So uh, I think um, the kernel and all that stuff came while we were working on, uh, we felt we, we need to find a co something common. So it, um, I was, um, I have, as I said, very good people in my company. So it's not that I have invented everything, but I have been, I can say, I've been leading it. That's, uh, that's very cool. And you touched upon uh, machine learning a bit. Um, yeah. Could you, like, probe a bit about the relation between machine learning and essence? Okay, can you say it again? Could you um, kind of? Um, uh, is there a relation that you see between essence and machine learning and in, in the future? I mean, I essence is, to me, to my knowledge, the only way to create an ecosystem of practices, a big ecosystem. Once you have that, uh, you have so many things you can do with the help of machine learning. The, the, what I see and I d must admit, I don't know uh, so much about what is going on in the AI. My daughter is, uh, has a leading role in AI, um, but we don't talk about so much about that. But what I see is the attempt is to find, using machine learning, all the way down from this mess of stuff we have in, in the universe, and try to make sense of that. That's a huge problem. I mean, uh, can we do it in 25 years? That's the scenario. Whereas using an ecosystem of practice and apply, we can uh, use AI uh, or to identify what practices should you use in your particular case. It's a, if you have a huge library of practices, it's an impossible thing to uh, ask every team to sit and select. So, and that's only one thing. Um, there are, uh, in every practice, you do uh, suggest people to do uh, activity or create a work product. That's excellent things to use uh, uh, techniques like ChatGPT to support. Um, and I don't, I don't think that we will get, just ask uh, the system, AI system, to produce something we we will interact, work uh, in a collaborate way with the AI and teach, prompt with the right questions, and that is what Waypoint did, my, what we did 20 years ago. It was so we, I see it as a co-pilot. It's another term that people use. We call it virtual consultant. We have a virtual consultant beside us to help us do the job. Very informative for a new <laughs> worker in the industry. You're welcome to contact me. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much. Hello. Ivar Boherfors, a uh, long-time friend of Ivar. Uh, I often get a question which is uh, quite simple. Can essence be 
white labeled. Can we be? White labeled, which means can a university or a but, uh, industry, can they use essence and name it something that they like themselves? Yes, I mean, uh, you probably need tools to make it easy, but uh, yes, we can, uh, we can change terms. We, can sh we have a term alpha that uh, some people have problem to uh, swallow, but uh, usually they, uh, usually they, they uh, soon love the term. I have one example. I won't tell you which university it is, but I, they have asked, can you rename, as we love Essence, can we rename it so it's part of our university's uh, uh, naming structure? I, I don't know. Uh, Essence is uh, an international standard. So uh, it is an international standard, but the question is if it can be renamed by a entity. I think uh, um, what I see this more like a tooling question. So you can, uh, um, in, in the tools we have, basically you can do anything of that nature because we know that uh, people have preferences and so on. But uh, we still want to keep the semantics, so we, we keep it all together at the end. There's a lot we can do. I, I'm sorry if I'd, I wish I could get a better, give a better answer. There. You can continue and debate a little bit later. You can debate it a little bit later. The last question, please. Oh, Oscar. Yes. Hi, you are. My name is Oscar. Thank you for a fantastic uh, lecture, by the way. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, in, in that elephant picture that you had, uh, right now I'm the guy that's touching the, the belly, uh, because I think uh, right now my understanding of essence is uh, it's a fantastic uh, thinking framework. So, you know, I'm still, you know, understanding everything. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, I recently learned about it. So obviously, you know, I didn't hear, hear about it during my education and I didn't hear about it during my first 10 years of being in the industry. But I think it's a fantastic tool that the industry would benefit a lot from, you know, more widespread adoption. So uh, I'm curious to hear your master plan for the next five or ten years, and you can't say AI. <laughs> what what are the other ways that you see you know that Essence will gain more traction in the industry, and how can we help you with that? <coughs> Let me give me a second. The best way to help is to get under the skin of essence and understand it. Um, not just superficially, but uh, under skin. Uh, I don't know anyone who has, over these many years, uh, since 2005, adopted essence, uh, these ideas, learned them, and then said it's wrong. So we feel we, it's, it's like a mushroom. It's growing. That, so the best way to help is to use it. And maybe you also will fall in love with it. <laughs> but um, uh, what will be the next uh, big thing after Essence? I think we have a backlog of things we want to do that will take us, uh, as we are a small company now, to um, many years in the future. But that is not okay. So um, we, we need to do something. We need to scale. And um, uh, as I said, I was at an investor meeting uh, last uh, Sunday, listened to others. But the guy who was leading it, he is a uh, famous Swede. He um, suggested maybe we should arrange something for you. I'm not looking for $750 million. <laughs> and I'm not looking for little either. So, we will see. I think it's, uh, uh, the backlog is so 
fantastic. It's so fantastic things that we can do that we never could do before. But we still have to do it. Thank you. Thank, thank you all, and thank you, Iva. Let's give I I Iva a big hand. Thank you. Thank you. And now, now Peter wants to share a small uh, yeah, optimist with the uh, uh, Iva. Iva. Welcome to the future. The journey has begun. You are going to need this on the way. Wow. <laughs> thank you. And you know, there is at least one thing. I totally, <laughs> yeah, uh, I totally gave it optimism, and so thank you, thank you so much. N now, this ladies and gentlemen, I will hand over to Mats Lundqvist. Uh, may I call you Vice President of Chalmers, uh, Mats, uh, Vice Rector, Nyttigörande, amongst other things. So Mats will have a small thank you speech. So, Mats, please. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, what a nice evening. First of all, thank you all for coming, Chalmerists in the room and online. Um, we're really proud at Chalmers to, to have uh, this event and we're really proud about our alumni association making it happen. So thank you so much for that. Um, I was pretty blown away by you, Ivor. I knew a bit about um, um, Gustav Dahlén, but I was also very much learned a few new things there too, but you really gave us an insider revolutionary s story about an industry being very crafty and very fa fashion oriented, perhaps through essence becoming something much more, not perhaps, I think you really believe that and I think you got a few believers here. That's just fantastic and that's just the last part of your very, very extensive career, starting with physical components that many here understand being used to actually go take the first steps of a software industry becoming less, what was it you call it, less buggy, what was the wor word before that, less defect, Less defect and less buggy, that's what I learned. So that's fantastic that you were part of that in the late 60s. And actually I've never thought that uh, the physical industry and the language you had with you was a basis for being a revolutionary within this software industry. Now, um, to understand that you've done so much, even being part of AXE, which I think is the biggest innovation still in in Sweden because it had so big effects, not just for the physical phone or the wired phone, but also then for you know the mobile phone and everything. So it really laid a foundation to learn that. And then a few other acronyms that I can't say yet. I will train, I will take at least two days to learn one day. Um, but that, that's just fantastic. So uh, I, only have one comment more, and that is you talked about gurus with a bit of a fear and you didn't really like them. And then I'm like, okay, but guru, that's a really nice thing, isn't it? You know, guru. Yeah, and then, and then you said, yeah, but they're just salesperson, basically. Okay, well, that's not a bad word in my world, even though I can understand it might be in your world. And then, and then, then you said, I'm not really a guru, but what did you do for the last half hour? You were selling Essence. <laughs> so I'm sorry, Ivar. You just have to be calling yourself still a guru, going very, very strong. And uh, I've heard that you're not super young anymore. It's impossible that you're super young. But the spirit and the energy and the presence that you have, still being a guru, still having this new thing, new new it's been around now for a while but you know selling the essence which I understand will decraftify and defashionify I can't even find a word here the help do that uh, a software industry which of course would be extremely helpful I think so so it's it's a true honor uh, for us all to be able to connect uh, with this story I will do 
my best and our best to make sure that Sweden and especially Chalmers can be a place where you feel you can connect. Uh, I know a little bit about being, you know, a prophet in your own country myself, um, because I've been here being that a bit, but you know, let's see what we can do to make you uh, connect even more also with the Swedish and the Chalmers side. I'm happy to continue that dialogue. So thank you so much. And as a small, or actually it's pretty big, but still a small token of our big appreciation, you will have, I would love you to take this and thank you so much on behalf of Chalmers and all of us. Thank you. So, Peter, thank you. Thank you for making us feel very, very close to no. our biggest genius and our Nobel Prize winner who was able to do so much even though he got totally blinded no. and in this explosion, he still kept on. Who would have? He did. Your granddaddy. But I would like to say thank you for the Dalian family, for Chalmers keeping the Dalian feeling of Dalian's uh, long career and all these difficulties in coming through. We much appreciate it. Well, thank thank you. you. We we think of our founder William still being around like a ghost, but I can feel that Gust Gustav is uh, so another ghost. There's two, at least two ghosts, <laughs> helping to constitute the spirit of Chalmers, so, and you helped really, you know, not being a I'll ghost, but talking about him. I'll see if I can find another one. No, we're fine. We're so proud yeah. of that. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank and you. Oh, yeah. And Thank I applaud you. to you as well. You. So, with that, I think there is uh, opportunities a few meters from here, so I'll leave the word for you, Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think we should give Mats a hand as well. Those of you who want and are here, you can walk over to Vikanders for a, for a mingle uh, up to nine o'clock. Uh, there are some drinks and some food. Some of you are smiling, so I say just pass away. Thank you so much for joining today. And those of you who have joined uh, on the web, thank you so much. And hopefully see you all in one month's time, March 9, we have another Gustav Dahlien speech to be given. Thank you for tonight.